Uh, without further ado, let me start by going directly to the main topic of uh, this two-hour lecture, which has to do really, as was mentioned earlier, mostly on, on modeling and less on data. And this is a reasonably recent topic about uh, collective dynamics. <coughs> so I will try to make in the next uh, three hours, that's what I have, a self-contained uh, presentation of this topic, mainly the development in the last 20 years. So let's start at the beginning. Collective dynamics, um, a main feature of them is the self-organization. Now, what is self-organized dynamics? So the whole three hours will be devoted for these nine pictures. And um, I'm classifying uh, self-organization uh, into three different classes of so-called agents. Living agents, thinking agents, and non-living agents. Even without specifying exactly what's going on, you feel that there is some sort of self-organization here. So what you see there um, is a flocking of birds, a school of fish, herds of sheep, or just a collection of cells which create tissues. So these are examples for living organisms. In contrast to thinking organisms, let's say our traffic or just uh, pedestrian or just human crowding, or even the, this is supposed to be the internet, but not the internet, but the propagation of opinions on the internet. So the dynamics is very important here. And last but not least, uh, non-thinking agents. So you see here all sort of, um, you should think of uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, uh, or some sort of terms which align themselves. And uh, there, there's a common feature in all these, Actually, it's, it's 12 examples. And the common feature is the following. There is a fascinating aspect where the interactions between the so-called agents is short range. Clearly, in all these examples, it's not that every item here connects to every item there, and so forth about human crowding, and so forth and so on. There is something which is inherently short range. And even without an external forcing or without some great uh, plan, the short-range interactions lead to the emergence of higher order structure, which we see. So one of the benefits of uh, working on self-organized dynamics is that everybody sends you uh, videos of flocking. So here's one of my favorite. I will not be able to explain, of course, this complicated uh, behavior, but uh, this is a canonical example of self-organizations, right? Clearly, in one way or the other, the birds interact with their immediate neighbors. What does it mean to have a neighbor? What does it mean to interact? And then they create what we see here on a large scale as a, as a global pattern. And this is fascinating in many aspects, so we try to understand what is really going on. So short-range interactions. What are the rules for the short-range interaction or engagement? Well, we have to explain the notion of neighborhood, which is essential, which is not clear. And there are many fundamental aspects that will be explored in the next hour. And they are called environmental averaging, alignment, synchronization, attraction, repulsion. There is issue of phase transitions. They have different names. But at the end, it's only one thing, short-range engagement. That's it. That's what it is. And then, despite the variety of different short-range engagements, as time goes to infinity and when, as we have large crowds, something emerges. That's what we would like to understand. And what emerges, they have also different names. They are called flocks or swarms, colonies, parties, consensus. They have different names, but it's the same thing. Short-range interactions, long-range patterns. So we would like to understand this globe, local global effect. So these are the fundamentals. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the next three hours. OK, so uh, quite recently, I will explore the, the 20 years plus hist history of bas basically the mathematics behind these kind of models. Quite recently, uh, they, they came from different aspects, but uh, I found uh, a quite pleasing unified explanation this collective dynamics, and I'm, I'm actually happy that I have this opportunity to, to show it to you. So um, let's start with something which is very classical, the end-body problem. So the end-body problem goes to Newton. <coughs> 
and it describes the dynamics of n bodies, heavenly bodies, and it describes by their uh, location, positions, and the velocities, and the statement is that the, they change the, the, the force is given by a weighted average. So I'm always using lambda to be the amplitude of what's going on on the right hand side, always. I will try. And then it says that the, the, the force is given by a weighted average. This is a potential which is given from the outside, a scalar function which is given from the outside. And these are the relative distances between a body at, located at i and body located at j. And we have to take into account all the other bodies with their impact on body uh, number i. And the typical example is, of course, the Lena Jones potential. So here's a notice that this function, scalar function, u, is a radial function. It depends just on the distance. So this is the absolute value, and this is vector valued. The x belongs to, say, some n-dimensional or d-dimensional vector space. But this scalar function is, is, is a, depending on, on the distance. And here's a canonical example of something which is uh, repulsive because it's decreasing and it's attractive because it's increasing. So this is the famous Lena Jones potential. It comes from atomic level. Jones, by the way, it's John Jones. He adopted the name of his wife, who was Lena, because she was uh, of higher nobility. So this is a canonical example, the end body problem. And what I would like to show, to unify everything that I will say in the next three hours, is to claim that the social interaction, not between atoms, but between birds or humans, could be understood if we had the word anticipation. Everything could be understood and explained with this notion of anticipation. So what is the meaning of anticipation? The meaning is that I do not react to the current situation, but I anticipate where will you be in a little while. So let's introduce a small parameter tau. This is a time parameter. Small time parameter tau. And let's assume that the force will not take into account the location of myself and the location of my neighbor at a given time, but a little while from now, which basically means I expect you to be where you are now plus tau times your velocity, which is a very reasonable thing when you think about social interactions. We always anticipate. I mean, this is not original. It goes to Pierre-Louis Lyons and many others. But in this context, I would like to emphasize this issue of anticipation. So I will react based on the anticipation of where will you be. OK. So once we introduce that, we can take this uh, gradient of the potential, and we can linearize. So one has to expand everything by Taylor expansion for small tau. If you expand everything for small tau, this is, of course, the uh, vector, which has to be with the gradient of the scalar potential. Now you linearize around the xi minus xj, so you get now the Hessian. And what you get is essentially two terms. So this is the original term. Here is the end body problem that you had before which is familiar, it's classical. And the next term, the correction, tends to be with the, to involve the difference of the velocities. And the phi ij, these are not scalar. I'm lying a little bit. These are not scalar. This has to do with the second derivative of the scalar u, the, 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 the potential u. So this is essentially a Hessian. It's a matrix which happens to be a rank one matrix. It's complicated. You don't want to pay attention. And that's the reason I'm lying a little bit here. Forget about everything. Just think that this phi ij is the leading term, which, as you can see here, is a scalar term depending on i and j. Actually, it's a matrix, a rank one matrix of this scalar uh, phi ij. So now we have two terms. We have the first term, and this term I will call alignment. And this is an external potential. And this will drive most of the models that we will discuss. Now, what are the phi ij? I just told you it's complicated. Unfortunately, in the human behavior and in living matters and in other aspects, I mean, we do not know what the capital U is. It's not that there is some Newton <coughs> law here. We do not know. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what, are, what is an I? Um, 
thank you very much for the question. This is a loaded lecture. So uh, the ni means only those j's such that phi ij is different from 0. Most of the time, phi ij will be 0. So the neighbor, so this is a, stands for the neighborhood which we will explore. And it takes into account what I mentioned before, that in some sense, this is the heart of matter. What is the nation of neighborhood? And the nation of neighborhood depends on the definition of the communication protocol phi. But what is the phi? I do not know. I do not know what is the phi. So the context of uh, the, the, the structure of phi is context dependent, and in general is not known. So how do we proceed? We just have phenomenological behavior of phi. For example, you want to believe that if you are further away from me, then the communication is weaker. So we want to assume that phi, which now you see it here, but it's some function of my state and your state. If our distance is, is growing, then phi is decreasing, which, by the way, is counterintuitive, but it's not always the case. So here's a phenomenological example. The most important is the, 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 the empirical derivation in different contexts of the phi. And in some cases, it's being learned from the data. So this is a recent work of uh, uh, Ming Zong, a former student, where they, they, they learn the behavior of phi from the data. But in all these cases, it's not dictated what is the phi. And therefore, I would like to raise the following question. So this is a general question. What classes of phi, what are the main properties of the phi from the point of view of modeling, which inflict the critical aspects of behavior for these models for connected, collective dynamics? That's basically what we can answer. So I would like to address the question, given different phi's, what are the main issues here that drives the global behavior? And as we shall see very quickly, there are some problems which are easy and well understood, but the hard problems are very difficult, the more realistic ones. So this is the general recipe, and here's the basic paradigm. So basically what we have is a crowd of N agents identified with their velocities. It could be other set of properties. And we can start with something from a different direction with environmental averaging. So pay attention here. Uh, I, I'm going to, to, to neglect now the external potential at all, and I would like to focus on this term only, because this is the new kid on the block. This goes back to the classical um, n-body problem. OK, so now uh, I start from a slightly different point of view, and we will converge to the same issue. We, we talk about environmental averaging, where I change my velocity at the next time step, which I call delta t, by taking a weighted average of the velocities of my neighbors. Here's the neighborhood. What are the weighted averages? These are the phi ij. These are the weights, which are the most important part of the modeling. And we do the following now. We take the time st step to be 1 over n. Um, and then if we subtract the vi from both sides, and we divide by delta t, and we let delta t goes to 0, we ignore the um, pairwise interaction. What is left is on the left-hand side, we get the rate of change of the velocities. And on the right-hand side, we get lambda has to do with the amplitude here. 1 over n is the time scale that you see there. Here is the phi ij that we have there. And minus vi is the term that I subtracted from here. So this is a canonical example for um, alignment term that we had before. That's exactly what we had before, modulo the pairwise interaction. And the important thing here is now, what are the phi ij? We can, for example, take the phi ij to be a function of the distance between two neighbors x, located at xi and xj. Yes? Maybe I'm missing something, but the argument is a little strange. You, you go to the limit by making delta t. I will, I will revisit it again. I will revisit it again. I'm, I'm, I, this is just a redigitation. I will come back. You are right, but I'm, I'm squeezing for a reason. I'll come back to that. So if we take now the phi to be depending just on the relative distance, what is the, the neighborhood in this case? The most important issue is the neighborhood. Well, here is me. I just draw a circle or a ball. Here's a ball of radius r0. r0 has to do with the diameter of the support of this function. I still did not tell you what the function is. It's some scalar function. 
So there is a ball, and everybody within my ball is influenced. I communicate everything outside the ball. I do not communicate. So here is the notion of a geometric neighborhood, because it's a ball. And indeed, many of the models for alignment, including repulsion and attraction, everything which depends on the relative distances, they basically, if this is the, a typical agent, they create sort of sequence of analogs. So, so this is the uh, ball of radius R0, and then there is repulsion, and then there is attraction that we will discuss as we go along. So this is the basic paradigm for geometric neighborhood. And before I come to the details, because this is not just a lecture, this is sort of a spring school, let me just tell you in one strike three canonical examples for geometric neighborhoods, three canonical models. So the first model, which goes to Cooker and Smail, was introduced in 2007, had a huge impact in the mathematical literature, is exactly what we are discussing here. Here is the amplitude, this is the number of agents, this is the inference function. Everything is clear here except one thing. What is the inference function? In their paper, they chose an inference function which is decreasing with the distance with power 2 beta, essentially. So this goes back to Cooker's mail. So this means that we have long-range alignment because this function has support which is infinite. And this is, goes back to the canonical example of Cooker's mail. Another <coughs> class of different and very important kernels, communication kernels, also has this kind of decay like 2 to the power beta. However, it's singular at the origin. Then the importance of the singularity is if you are very close to me, I pay a lot of attention, much more than the bounded kernel. And then uh, finally, there is the Vickshuk model. They all have to do with flocking at this level, which was introduced in 1995 and had an, an enormous impact in the physical uh, literature. And over there, what you average are the orientation, not just the velocities, but the orientation. So you look at a bird located at point xi. You create a ball of radius r0, a fixed ball. And hence, it's a short range interaction. You take the average of all the velocities. You normalize. You multiply by a fixed predetermined speed. And this is your new velocity. So here, basically, you align the orientations and not the velocities. But the important thing is that the interaction is local and not global, short range and not long range. And that's a completely different story. And this is part of the title of this series of lectures. So this is typically in a reasonable lecture. I will stop here, and I will move to the analysis. But now we are in school. So what I thought of doing is now is to stop and to bring now a series of 10 examples slowing down, including addressing the question of, of Wolfgang, which comes from a different part of the literature, in, in scientific literature, about this kind of models for uh, collective dynamics. So let me start with the different models. And these are called uh, agent-based models, because they are at the level of agent-based description. Later on, we will move to higher order descriptions. So what is the basic paradigm? So the basic paradigm in all these cases, I, I decided to choose environmental averaging. I already forgot about anticipation. I would like to focus just on the, this process called alignment. So we have a class of agents, and they are characterized by traits, which I will denote now by bold P. And P could stand for anything, including velocities, but not only. As you will see, most of the literature does not have to do with velocities. It has to do with different kind of properties. And the idea is that this property of agent i at the next time level is replaced by the average of some neighbors. And now this average could be anything. I don't even denote them by phi ij. It's just some averaging. They are non-negative, and they sum up to 1. So these are convex combinations. <coughs> now we subtract the property pi from both sides, and we divide by delta t. So on the left-hand side, we get the rate of change of this property. And on the right-hand side, I subtract the pi. Now I divide by delta t, and I call 1 over delta t lambda, which is a little bit stretching it, because I'm going to take lambda to be, this is essentially the frequency to be fixed. And I'm going to let delta t go to 0, but keeping it here as a constant on the right-hand side. If I do this, then I get. Sorry. 
Uh, before the same before with I do the N this, before. say it again. The same with the N. Before. Yes, yes, yes. Now, before I do this, let, let me say something very important, uh, because this is the only point I will mention. But actually, it's in the back of my mind all the time. So when I do this, this is perfectly kosher. But at the same time, I can do also that, and this is also the same thing. This is due to the fact that the sum of the A I J equals to one. Why these two things are the same, and why they are very, so important? So let me just say one word about that. What you see here is the following statement. The rate of change on the left is balanced by what? By a multiple of the difference between my state and average of the states of my neighbors. This kind of difference between me and my neighbors is a canonical example for an elliptic operator. This is exactly an ellipticity. If you want, this is exactly the Laplacian. Correct? So this is one point. This is the same thing because the AIJ add up to one is writing that. This is completely different. This is the following statement. I take my state and I take the state of my neighbor. The difference is called a discrete gradient. Now I take all the local gradients, all the different changes, and I weighted them. And then I take the weight of the differences. That's a completely different point of view where you see a change due to the local gradients. So one, of course, they're the same, because one is ellipticity, another thing is a local gradient, but it's important to highlight it at this point. And now we have to choose the AIJ. Now comes the issue of the modeling. And as I told you, we will take something which depends on my position and the position of the neighbor. This is just one example. There could be many others. But we will take this kind of localized version. And then we have to normalize by something so that the AIJ will add up to 1, or at least something which is close to 1. So if we want to normalize by something, I call it the degree, well, the something must be the sum of all the influence of all the neighbors on me, so that when I normalize it, I will get something which adds up to 1. Of course, what is the phi is context dependent. So this is a general uh, basic paradigm. And it comes from, from different corners of scientific disciplines. And despite the variety, there are some similar fundamental features which are connected with this kind of uh, paradigm. And in particular, the phenomena of emergence of flocking consensus and so on. So here are the 10 examples. Example number one, Krause model for opinion dynamics. So Krause, Ulrich Krause, uh, who visited me a few years ago, is a very nice fellow, introduced this model uh, in 1997. And this has to do with opinion dynamics. So let's start. This is the simplest model. I love it. In this case, the traits or the properties are just opinions. <coughs> Every agent <coughs> has a vector or, or scalar opinion. So what, what is the model? The model is uh, I'm changing my opinion by taking a weighted average of all the opinions, so this is the sum, this is the weighted average of all the opinions which are close to mine. Very simple. In fact, deceivingly simple. In fact, when you come to think about it, you say, come on, this I know everything about that. And I claim that you know nothing about this model because it's an extremely complicated model. And the reason is this notion of neighborhood. You see, when you write it here, you think that this is a linear model. Actually, it's highly nonlinear model. The reason is that if this is me, I will continue with this scenario where I am the, the agent with tag I, then my neighbors, they, they come and go because they change their opinion. So they can come and go. I don't know exactly how many neighbor, neighbors participate in my neighborhood. So this means that this neighborhood is time dependent. In fact, it depends on the global configuration, and so is the number of neighbors that I communicate with. And hence, this model is highly nonlinear. But it is environmental averaging, because the AIJ here, which sum up to 1, they are simply given by an influence function depending on the distance in opinion normalized. And in this case, in the case of uh, Krause model, the influence function is simply the characteristic function of the interval 0, R0. Right? So you are either with me or I, I pay no attention. But you can think of an influence function which is completely different, which is decaying, slowly decaying. And what is the degree? The degree, in this case, of the characteristic function simply counts. It's the counting number, how many 
agents are uh, communicated or influenced by my opinion or are influenced by them. So this is an example for a local model. The most important thing in this model is that it is local, right? Because we have finite support, compact support. So environmental leveraging in this case, we can run again the same story. We can subtract the opinion of the typical agent here from left and from right, we divide by delta t, we let delta t goes to zero, and most of the time I will consider the semi-discrete approach where the rate of change of the opinion is proportional to the difference between the opinion and the average, the local average of the crowd. Aij in this case are given as a function of the difference of opinions, normalized, we have to talk now about the degree, and there are two cases, either we count the local neighbors, so this is the local number of neighbors, and uh, that's what is written here. Or we are talking about global neighbors, depending on the phi. So as you can see, the modeling of the communication protocol is absolutely essential. It's the one thing which I do not know. What I would like to study is how different protocols lead to different behaviors. In general, the number AIJ here are not equally distributed. They could be tilted in a severe way. Yes. I mean, there, there are so much efforts to do this kind of distinctions of fairly subtle properties of these files. But an underlying uh, assumption is kind of isotropy. You, you are always looking I would at, about it. at all. It's like the bird behind the should influence be much less than the one in front of it. Right? I'm, I'm very happy that you are engaged. I already engaged you, yes. Of course, of course. I will mention that. I mean, we have to do, yeah, yeah. Of course, as, as you say, all these models so far, I mean, it's not precise. I mean, OK, they are isotropic because I assume that there's geometric neighborhood. Yeah. Once I assume geometric neighborhood, the most important thing about the ball is that it's isotropic, which already you object, and so do I. So we'll have and to put also it. Also, the norm when you compare opinions, I mean, it must be tremendously uh, dependent on the similarity notion of quality. Yes. For instance, so I, th there is another issue here. So a typical question. Yeah. So the typical question here is, does averaging leads to consensus? But in order to address this question, of course, the, the most important thing is, in this case, issue of, uh, issue of opinion dynamics, I put here the norm yeah. of xi minus xj. Now, if the xi is a scalar, okay, I understand that it's the absolute value of the difference. But if I have a vector of opinions about soccer, politics, and the church, and so do you, how do you measure the distance in opinions between the three of us? Who says that it's actually a metric? Right. So the notion of neighborhood becomes much more uh, evasive. I agree. But at least in the scalar case, just to give you an example, if we accept the idea that uh, we have just one scalar opinion, so here's an example just to show you. Um, here's a distribution of 100 agents with opinions ranging from 0 to 10. So each agent has just a scalar opinion, one scalar opinion. Okay? And you can see that this is a distribution, so this is the, distribu the initial distribution of opinions, and as time goes on, the opinions change, and what you get here are five parties. They do not communicate anymore. And then in a different context, you can start with the same distribution of opinions, and you get here essentially a consensus. They all concentrate in the same opinion. And what distinguishes between the two essentially is only one thing. It's the same model, the, communica the pro communication protocol, the file. Why in one case we get this? Why in another case we get that? Here's another example, two-dimensional example, not just one-dimensional. So you can see here that you, you, you get concentration of different parties. You, you can call it whatever you want to, but you can de definitely get clustering. This is two-dimensional. You wait. Finally, these two fall in love. That's it. End of the story. That's it. OK. So this is what we are talking about. And of course, I'm raising the question that you raised, or Frank, of course. How do we measure the distance once we have vector? What does it mean even? I agree. Let me move to, uh, there are many more. There are hundreds of papers 
on opinion dynamics in the social science literature. I, I just want to mention, you don't have to remember everything, but I mentioned that just in order for, to calibrate ourselves, that there is a world outside mathematics that is very important. Uh, so I, I made here a sort of few comments. These are all first order examples. Uh, for example, you, you have to take a probabilistic terms. So there is, you introduce a probability of jumping from one state to another state. And um, this is a typical example. So here's the reference here. Once you introduce the probability, what it would be the probability you move from one state to another state? So this is one canonical example. And in opinion dynamics, you have what is called the voter system. And again, you have to define some sort of a transition rate. So all these canonical ideas appear in different aspects. Uh, particularly the work of Ben Naim, the work of Tsitsiklis, um, they, they are related to the Ising model, the Axelrel model, propagation of languages. So there's a whole world out there that I never discussed, but you can just think of everything that has to do with changing a state by taking a weighted average fall into this category. Uh, let me move to a second example still a first order example, which has to do with robots. Again, there's a huge literature there, but I just want to highlight one point. So now the state vector is the vector of positions. It's not opinions, it's the real position. So you have a robot, which is in a certain position. Actually, you have a crowd of robots, and they change the position depending on the position of the other robots. How it's being done? Well, uh, they change their position by taking a weighted average of the difference of the positions with the other crowd, here's the weight, depending on some function, which is a function of the distance, and normalize that properly, because we know it already. Well, what is special about this model is that it's a gradient model. By gradient, so we can understand it as a gradient descent model if we introduce this function, scalar function k of x, which has to do with the sum of the j's. This is a function of x. The sum of the j's, where this capital phi is the primitive of the original communication protocol, it turns out that when we compute its gradient, we get exactly the interaction that we want there, up there. So essentially, we can write our model as the rate of change of my position has to do with, up to a scalar multiple, minus the gradient of something. And gradient uh, dynamics is very important for many other aspects that I will not elaborate here. I just don't have the time. But it's important to realize that these are gradient descent methods. And in particular, the functional k is therefore decreasing along the path. And the one, canonical problem, one of the canonical problems in this uh, robotic dynamics is it's called the rendezvous problem. So you start with a collection of robots and you ask yourself, when do they meet? When is the meeting point and when do they meet? And of course, there is a huge literature. I'm just trying to ignite you to, to if you, you come to the engineering literature, to see this kind of robotic uh, the rendezvous problem. And this brings me to, an, here's an example. Let's take, the, let's take the function phi of s or phi of r to be 1 over r. Notice that now it's singular. Why is it so special 1 over r? 1 of r corresponds, by the way, to 2 beta equal to 1 in the case of singular kernel. So what does it mean? Well, you see, now if I take phi of s to be 1 over r, what you get here is xj minus xi normalized by the distance. Let's cut it off also. Let's make it localized. So what is the meaning? Well, now this is actually the radius vector between two agents. You normalize. It means that it just depends on the angle. It does not depend on the distance, just on the angle. So suppose every robot can see just the angle of the other robot, but not the distance. Because you assume that this is sharp along the radius vector. So you look at this model, and there are many models of this, of this nature, and here's the singularity, and this is sort of hysteresis. There's a limit visibility. You can just see in a cone, exactly as you mentioned. But here's one fact. I will not have time, maybe I will later on talk about it. In this case, the rendezvous problem is being solved and at a finite time. 
all the robots at a finite time will get to the same meeting point. Okay, so basically these references talk about, I mean, these are just two examples for this kind of uh, sensor-based networks, robotic agents, where it depends on the... The students ask, these slides will be made available. A concentrated version of that, uh, depending on the angle. Okay. Okay, more about environmental averaging. In cultural dynamics, I already mentioned the axle road model, when there is some sort of uh, periodicity. There is issue about <coughs> evolution of languages, the behavior, criminal behavior, uh, the work of Bertozzi and her, her group, a plus dynamics. When you are in a stadium and someone starts to, to you have applause and then you see that something propagates. It exactly fits that. Economic environment, the production networks and marketing, advertisement. You realize that advertisement has to do with some sort of propagation through neighbors. Pedestrian and traffic models, there is nothing to say. Um, I mean, I, I took here some, I always like this. Uh, never mind. Um, randomized gossiping. Gossiping is a very important human behavior, and you realize that gossiping is, of course, something which has to do with through the process of averaging. So there's a lot about environmental averaging in the cultural dynamics, and there's a lot of activities that took place in various U.S. centers, including at IPAM, in, in, in Maryland, and in, in Brown. Okay, let, let's move to the third example, which is the Vikshek model. The Vikshek model was introduced in 1995 by Vikshek and this collaborators, including Eshel Ben Jacob, used to be my colleague. And this, in this case, you're talking about birds, and this is alignment of orientation. So let's, let's dwell a little bit about this very important model. So the idea is this. You take all the birds, and you assume that they have a fixed speed. This is a very severe assumption. They have a fixed speed. And the only thing that they, each bird changes is just its orientation. That's the only thing that it can change. OK, so orientation. Let's take it in a general d-dimensional space. So the, this is omega i, the orientation of bird number i. <coughs> and uh, bird number i changes its orientation by taking a weighted average of the orientation of the <coughs> neighbors, <coughs> weighted average, and multiply it by the fixed speed s. This gives you the new orientation. However, when you do this, you have to get something on the unit ball. It's not on the unit ball. So you do two things. First of all, you add noise, because it is very important, the noise. But whenever you do that, you are not staying on the unit ball, so you normalize. And this is the Vickshik model. And then what about the noise? You add a noise uniformly with intensity tau. So there are two things here. First of all, um, you look at your, your, your neighbors. You add noise. It's something new. And this is about orientation. Now, what about the weights? We did not finish the model. Now comes the weights. It's obvious the weights uh, will have to do with some function depending on the relative distance between a bird located at i and at xi and a bird located at xj. So the important thing here, first of all, this is a second order model. It involves not just the xi, but xi and the velocities. OK. So this is the Vickshek model. This is a second order model. So we change the location by taking into account the velocity, and the orientation dictate what the velocity is. And uh, this is a different version due to the Gordon Moch uh, for a Vickshek model that I will not elaborate because I'm running out of time, which has to do, because you have to make sure that whatever you have on the right-hand side stays on the unit disk. So you create this kind of a projection, which always takes the right-hand side and puts it back on the unit disk. It's just a different way of writing it. It's a very elegant way to writing that. So this is the, the Vickshek model. And the important thing in the Vickshek model is this uh, order parameter, which has to do with the average velocity normalized by the speed and the total number of the birds. If Remember, you have many birds in different directions. <coughs> if you sum up all the velocities or the orientation, you expect two things. Either they will cancel out and they will come out to zero, or they will prefer a preferred direction. So these are two extremes. Depending on this parameter, it turns out that there is a phase transition in this problem. 
So for global alignment, it turns out that this phi prefers a certain direction, and this is where the level of noise is very low. So when there is no noise, something emerges, emerging as a preferred direction. When the level of noise is high, then it turns out that there is some uh, disorder and averaging so that the direction is averaging out. What happens at the, as you change tau, it turns out that there is some critical behavior, and there was a lot of, I don't know if controversy, but disagreement about this behavior uh, and about the phase transition which involves as you change the parameter tau. I will not get into details because nevertheless it's extremely important, the phase transition in the physics community, and this is one of the reasons that uh, the Vikshik model had a huge impact in the physical literature. And uh, there was a lot of studies about the phase transition depending on this parameter tau. So let me just uh, mention here, uh, this is just part of the eminent uh, scientist, Wilson, who is a fa famous scientist, and Ian Cousins, and they, they argue why the phase transition is so important as a mechanism of nature to propagate information. Okay, let me move to a more Vickshack-like models, and this is a fish displacement, a displacement by the persistent turning worker alignment. So this is actually a work, I, I love this work because it shows you the following. So here's a, this is the actual experiment. And this is the individual trajectory of what you've seen here, and this is actually the simulation. What is the simulation? as we are getting better and better, the idea is that you change your location according to orientation, and the orientation, of course, in two dimensions is given in terms of theta. You change the orientation, and this gives you the curvature, and you change the curvature by taking a weighted average of the curvature of your neighbors. So it was ter termed persistent turning walker plus alignment, and this is exactly what you see here, which is pretty impressive. But you get the idea environmental averaging, but now it is on the level of curvature. Example number four has to do with the celebrated Kukersmell model. The Kukersmell model is uh, another type of model for flocking, and the idea is that we change the velocity, now it's not the orientation, it's the full velocity, by taking a weighted average of the velocities, velocities of the neighbors. So of course we can start in this kind of an example, and it's a second order model because the weight have to do again with the geometric neighborhood. It's a second order model. Again, as I said, I change my location according to the velocities. I move to the semi-discrete description. And finally, I can write it either as an elliptic operator or a weighted of the local gradients. OK, two cases. In the original work of Cooker and Smail, they choose the influence function to decrease in a polynomial, polynomial manner. And a lot of work was done and ignited simply because there was a lot of analysis about the criticality of the power beta. It turns out to be that beta equal to half is critical whether or not there is a flocking behavior. And this is in sharp contrast to local models. In local models, the function phi is compact support. Only few birds interact with the neighbors as experiments show that really birds only realize their immediate neighbors and not the whole group. And then Cooker and Smale is a very nice model, but if you have phi here to be compactly supported, then we will see that there is some fundamental difficulty to understand the dynamics. Okay, <clears throat> now we come to this issue that uh, the state space is not homogeneous and I'm approaching what uh, Volker mentioned. So we keep normalize everything by the number of the birds, capital N, because this is canonical example in statistical physics. Is it reasonable? So I would like to point out here something important. This is wrong in some fundamental way, and here is a canonical example. Suppose I belong to a small group, which I call group one. I'm one of the birds here, and there is a huge group, group two, which is very far away. We will assume implicitly that this model will say, well, this group is far away, and since phi depends on the relative distances, these birds will not influence my dynamics because I will be influenced by my immediate neighbors. This is not the case. 
And the reason is that if we have N1 birds or agent in this group G1 and N2, which is much larger in G2, I have to divide by the total number of birds. And even though the sum of the interactions, there are two sums, my immediate neighbors, the neighbor far away, this is completely negligible because phi ij is completely small. If I have to normalize and to divide here by the total number of birds, n1 plus n2, n1 might be small, but n2 is huge. And basically, the right-hand side will be 0. And that's what we don't want that. So clearly, something is wrong in the model. And the thing is that what is wrong in the model is we assume that this scenario, the configuration, is far from equilibrium. Only when we are close to equilibrium, this kind of normalization is relevant. But when we are far from equilibrium, we have to do something else. We do not want to divide by the total number of agents, but we want to divide by the degree. And what is the degree? The degree is the total amount of influence that being exerted on agent number i. So this is a work with a former postdoc Sebastian Boch. And this is the same degree that I mentioned before. And indeed, when we think about this degree, what happens when you take these two group N1 and N2, you see when I belong to group uh, G1, then essentially the degree here will be N1. So when I normalize by the degree, it will be N1. When I normalize the degree here, it will be essentially N2. So this normalization is adaptive, and it's changing according to where I am. Therefore, we find out that this normalization is important. Okay. However, it, now we create an interaction. It's not the phi ij. It's the phi ij normalized by the number, which is the degree, depending only on i. And then this matrix is not symmetric. Okay. So before we continue, here's an example. I just want to show you that it's alive. So here's an example for the caucus male on the left versus the much tadmo on the right. Essentially, what you see here, and I never defined what flocking is, you can see that over time there and clearly here, all the velocities will turn in the same direction, even though they start in different directions. And the support of the group stay within finite diameter. So you can talk about a flock, namely a finite diameter block that goes in the same direction, and there, hence you get flocking. There are more Cochrane male models. I must mention uh, the review article of Bialik from 2013, which actually derives a Cochrane male like model from the first principle. And without getting into details, because the, the literature is, is huge, and here's the alignment terms, here's the amplitude, here is some sort of external forcing, here's this additional forcing, here's the noise, and everything is adjusted to the average speed. That's basically what is in that paper. Um, here's another thing which is completely different. I love this example of Haskovich from 2013, just to show you the richness of the phenomena we can talk about. Suppose we take phi to depend on, this is the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1, and here I take xi minus xk normalized by xi minus xj when I sum over all the k's. What does it mean? It means that if there are two agents, then the interaction depends how many agents are closer to me than how many agents are closer to you. If more agents are closer to me, then there is inter interaction with me. Otherwise, there is interaction with you. So this actually introduced for the first time something which is not necessarily, first of all, isotropic, and not necessarily depending purely just on the distance. You notice it does not depend just on the distance between xi and xj. This is topological because it's counting the numbers of agents closer to each one of us, which I will come later on, much later on. But this is just to show you that by small changes of the, not the influence function, but how you interpret the influence function, you get something which is fundamentally different. There are many other aspects that I will not mention. There is multi-scaling, what I told you about the Moch Tadmo. It's not scaling in space, it's about time, different clocks. The intrinsic property, it is not true that you come to a room, you change your opinion constantly. It's just not realistic. This is not the case. For example, you have convictions. I did not talk about that. There's repulsion attraction that I will mention towards the end. There's issue of short-range interaction that I will not talk about. Synchronization I will mention because it's beautiful. There's issue of control. There's issue of obstacles. Let's talk about vision because you raised the question. 
In fact, when there is one bird which follows the other, it has a cone of vision, right? It's not isotropic. So how do we cope with that? Well, we put it into the neighborhood. We say that the neighborhood consists only of those agents, not in isotropic behavior, but those that essentially the angle between where I'm heading and my velocity is limited by a certain level theta. So this model was introduced with Moch in 2011. And of course, the analysis of this model is extremely complicated simply because we do not know how to show that this cone of vision is invariant in time. It changes, constantly changes. And then it's co very, rather complicated. I think that this is a reference where the analysis of this model was done. Another thing is about leaders. I will mention more about that. It's the, the dynamics is not isotropic because there are always leaders that either emerge or we follow, but the, the configuration space is not homogeneous. So here's an example, example number seven, about evolution of leaders. Another slight change completely changed everything. So if you remember, this is the original model, the basic paradigm that I mentioned before, where basically we have the PI minus PJ, so this is the alignment term, here are the weights, this is the neighborhood, everything is clear. Now we slightly change it, and everything will change with it. And what is the slight change? Is this red term. So we have some influence function here, it's understood, but why, why this red term is so important? And the neighborhood takes into account only the terms where this red term is essentially bounded from above and below, to cut a long story short. Now what is this red term? So this red term is the following. <coughs> oh. uh -huh. uh, OK. So, so in this case, the red term reflects the fact that uh, uh, in life, the interaction, we are not atoms, the interaction is not along the radius vector between two agents. Again, there's such an, time and again I hear talks about collective dynamics and they tell you about agent and so forth, but at the end they think particles. So I would like to destroy it. These are not particles. They are not particles. And one of the main issues in particles, of course, that you think that particles, they interact about the radius vector, which is wrong. So I mentioned here a few examples, educations. Right? Or, or, or sense of smell rather than vision. In sense of smell, let's take it as an example, an end does not necessarily sense the other end where the other end is right now, but where it was before. Right? When you are educated or you like to follow the footprint of someone, you do not study exactly what he's doing now, but you are influenced by what he did before. So this essentially is a vector, and this is the projection of this vector so that this term is the closest to you. This is just a projection. Right? And this is the statement that we uh, uh, agent trace the history of the neighbors and not necessarily the current position. And this is exactly this kind of model. So let's see what will be the effect of that if we just run it. And the effect is rather obvious if you look at the steady solution, but to cut a long story short, here is the first of the model you start with a random distribution, and what you get, you do not get concentration along points, but concentration along lines, because these are the steady states. So you start with random distribution, you get lines, right? And it makes sense, because everyone just look at the history of another person, and somehow they are aligned along lines. But once they align along lines, what you get is the emergence of leaders. And this is true for first and second order model. So this is example number seven. Example number eight has to do with synchronization. For example, I'm not synchronized because I wanted to finish, I will finish at 10 plus, but I'm only in example number eight. And this is the famous Kuramoto model. We will not talk about Kuramoto model, which is a whole department by itself, except to say the following. What we have now is this collection of clocks which try to synchronize, and it's much more than clocks, and the model goes like that, that each <coughs> clock has an angle of phase theta, and they change the phases by taking a weighted average of the sine of their theta versus the theta of the neighbors. And there are some uh, uh, intrinsic frequencies that I will push aside, 
All I wanted to say, when, when we take sine theta j minus theta i and we divide by theta a, theta j minus theta i, of course we get averaging. And once we have environmental averaging, we can talk about collective dynamics, we can talk about in this synchronization, and the synchronization is given here by the effective radius, and then there is some critical behavior, and the whole story, rather than talking about the mathematics that I cannot do, is just to intrigue you with the following. And you can see with different, so you have here different clocks, you can see with different parameterization, either you get synchronization or you get off-synchronization, and so forth and so on. So this is an interesting, um, area synchronization, which has a large literature, and it goes after the Kuramoto model as being the, the canonical example. This brings me to example number nine, which control, I cannot not mention uh, the issue of control, which covers most of the engineering literature about collective dynamics. And the idea is that to whatever we have here, we add one more term on the right hand side, and this term should drive the system as we wish to some preferred scenario. For example, uh, the vector u have here certain singularities, like they create a wall so that they enforce the connectivity and the consensus or the rendezvous problem, and it depends on many models. Uh, th th there is a lot of body of work here that I cannot mention, but I must mention this issue of control. It's extremely important. There is an issue of trying to control with sparsity um, and so forth and so on. Okay. So these are just what you see below, uh, just a list of references in robotics and so forth. And then uh, example number 10, external forcing. So here's a canonical example which goes to Ian Cousin, I believe. Here's our hiding here is the alignment term. What you see here is that all those agents which are too close to you, they are being repelled. There is a minus sign here, so this is a repulsion. <coughs> and then, if you are not too close, if you are not too close, then there is alignment and then there is attraction. So you would like to stay with the crowd, you align yourself with the crowd, but don't get too close to me. So this is a canonical example, and the fact that there is repulsion, attraction, and alignment goes back to uh, Craig Reynolds, who is another interesting fellow that introduced this kind of paradigm and won for this paradigm the 1998 uh, uh, Oscar for uh, realistic animation of what he called voids. Actually, it was birds. And then uh, there are other external forcing which I did not talk, and of course, they and they create a whole sort of patterns which is beyond the level of this talk. Okay, now here's a summary. So I start some 20, 25 minutes ago to tell you that I will cover 10 examples. I hope I convince you that there is really a body of work which uh, I, I just uh, very concisely said, well, there is Cooker Smail with a long range alignment, there is a singular uh, kernel, and then there are short range kernel. That, that's basically what I'm talking about. So to summarize this part, the self-organization appears in different parts of the science. In biology, there is a very important role for the empirical data. We try really to understand, we, I'm not a biologist, but you can try to see that in the in biological uh, literature, the, the methodology is to, to see whether the observed patterns are system specific, not to unify, but to learn in each case what is the communication protocol. This is in contrast to the literature in physics where they see these kind of problems as complex systems and though they are different, they try to see that ensembles act similarly and can they classify the different patterns under some unified terms, at least in cases which are close to um, thermal equilibrium. In computer science, I did not mention computer science, there's a huge literature on this problem in computer science, they see this agent uh, forming nets and graphs, and we will talk about graphs in the next hour. And this is a very important uh, description because I did not talk about connectivity. Connectivity is the most important aspect in all these kind of models. And then in engineering, I just mentioned to you this issue of control and trying to drive the system as you like. And then in the mathematical literature is 
doing exactly what I'm trying to show you here, namely to study how different classes of phi's give rise to different kind of phenomena, macroscopic phenomena. Okay, and with this, it brings me to the real question of what happens with all these models? How do we study the large time behavior of this model? And I think this is a good point to stop here. So thank you. We'll make a break for- We have 10 minutes or so? 10 minutes? I will just run faster. <coughs> There's no problem. <laughs> thank you.